a, an inversion layer or anything like that. But basically, your rays from the sun, which contain energy, reflect off the surface of the Earth and warm the air directly above it. Um, sheltered warmed air accumulates just over the surface of the Earth until something breaks that, that surface tension or inertia that it has to want to move. It kind of wants to stay where it is. So there's a few trigger mechanisms that can help to release a thermal from the ground once you've got this hot bubble of air sitting above the surface. Once you've released it with a trigger, which could be a car driving past, could be the wind blowing and just suddenly knocking it free. This pocket of warmer air, which due to the fact that it's been warmed up, is lighter than the surrounding air and also warmer, will rise up into the unstable atmosphere or through the unstable atmosphere around it. Eventually it will show you, show as little cumuluses like you see in this picture over here. Only if there's sufficient moisture in the package of air and that package of air reaches what is known as the dew point, the point at w the temperature, dew point temperature, the temperature at which the um, moisture in, in that packet, the vapor actually comes into something we can see moisture, visible um, water in the form of a cloud. So, as we were talking about the warm air, this is, this is the, I'm now going to describe the life cycle of thermals in relation to what we know every day, cumulus clouds, etc. All these diagrams come out of Helmut Reichmann's book, uh, Cross Country Soaring. Quite fabulous book, if anybody can lay their hands on it, maybe find it in a second hand store. Don't know if it's still being sold, but it's a fabulous cross country book. As I said, the sunlight shines down on the air, on the ground and the ground reflects up and the air pocket around it starts getting warmed up. The trigger, for example, the wind blows against it and suddenly this pocket of air starting to rise up. This is the start of the lift phase of this whole process. This pocket of air over here starting to gently right, go up in, in, in the sky due to the fact that it's lighter and warmer. And sometimes an entire column can appear like, like you see over here just from the source of heat at the bottom there, rising, 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 rising until you get this, this haze dome right at the top. You just start seeing it with a good pair of sunglasses. You'll actually see these little haze domes on the, at the top of thermals. Still within the lift phase, all this air is upgoing air. You can utilize it at any stage. Your condensation appears as soon as uh, you reach the dew point level. So that's the, mo the moisture is now condensed into a visible form of water vapor and your cloud starts forming. Um, as, I, as you note here, you started the cloud formation now still usable lift going up at the same time. At this stage, your cloud base consolidates into a much bigger cloud at the top. You can see it's a nice flat bottomed cumulus cloud. Great thing to get under. You'd fly in from this side, coming in from the side, hop in underneath it and spiral up in it. Um, your cloud is still forming. You've still got lift. Possibly your heat source on the ground is being obscured, maybe by the same cloud, maybe by another cloud around, and it's starting to die out. Mostly this happens. Now it breaks free from the ground. Now you've got that pocket of upgoing air, which is still lighter than the surrounding. More moisture air and uh, heat, heat, heated moisture and air going up. Condensing. You're seeing a beautiful cumulus cloud appearing at the top here. Fabulous still to be soaring under. Next thing that happens is it peaks out. The lift is now dying out. You also in this previous um, picture and, and see that we're starting to see sinking air coming from the top of the cloud around the outside of the cloud while the center of the cloud still got this domed up appearance over here and still rising. When your thermal starts running out from underneath the cloud, so now you've no longer got any lift being generated by heat coming off the ground and heating the surrounding air. 
you start dissipating energy through the top of the cloud and it starts coming down the sides of the cloud and the cloud starts looking raggedy underneath. You don't re it doesn't really look good. And you're heading towards the sink phase in the cloud. Once again, now the cloud starts dissipating again. There's no energy to keep the water moisture up. It's starting to sink down again. It'll disappear as it uh, goes in the opposite direction of condensation as it gets warmed up again. That cloud at this point is turned into something that is totally and utterly unusable for gliding, and this is where you want to get out of it. So as we're coming along here, you'd be flying along, and boop, you'd hit the cloud. You'd go down to your McCready speed that you've got. You'd maybe you decided you're going to have four, two knots of lift in your next thermal, and you'd fly in the McCready speed, and you'd thermal up, 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 up to the top. And then you'd probably get out or get out before it gets to the phase number eight over here of dissipation. If you happen to be coming along here and there's this cloud and you see it dissipating, you're going to see that your McCready setting of two is going to force you to speed up and go down through the sinking air and get out of it a lot faster. And then finally, the cloud dissipates and once again, we've got blue sky around it. So simple life cycle of a cumulus cloud has a very strong core of rising air. And around the outside, there will be sink. So wherever there's something going up, something's got to come down, as simple as that. The closer to the ground, the thermals are more narrow. They're slightly disorganized. If they haven't really grouped. The energy hasn't grouped into a solid mass. Closer to the ground, they lower. And we've all, well, most of us that have flown cross country and outlanded, etc., have thought we could get to the next cloud and gotten there too low and gotten into the really weak lift at the bottom of the thermal where it hasn't consolidated itself, and we've ended up landing out. So I'm grow stronger. Uh, Tom, I'm just going to chime in for just a second on that. Go ahead. Um, this is also in support of the whole low save concept. Uh, which we'll be talking about in the cross-country piece. Um, so, you know, you're experiencing good lifted altitude. You get down into those lower bands, you're not going to be able to save it. So pick a good field and safely land out. And again, we'll go into more detail on that in the cross-country piece. But, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Valid point from our safety officer. Thank you, David, yes. Um, yes, and David also brought another point in there, which I don't know. I probably will get it at some stage. There is something known as the working band where there's good lift at altitude and good lift coming down and then the lift gets bad and that working band changes every day. So you might have a nice working band between 3,000 and 5,000 feet above the ground or above sea level. Anything below 3,000 might be just plain horrible to fly in. Uh, I do know that XE saw in quite a few of the other flight calculators or, or, or software applications will actually determine the band for you while you're flying. Uh, thermal gets weaker as you approach, approach the cloud waste. Well, not always, but yes, it does get weaker. It is weaker than uh, somewhere in this big core in the middle here. Not as weak as what it is on the ground, but you'll, you'll find it peters out. The band does normally does not, good working band normally does not run all the way to cloud base. So you don't really have to fly into cloud with your Bowley compass, which you might have read in one of the books about. Uh, most of these thermals are 600 to 1,000 feet in diameter when they get to altitude. So it's, what is that, a fifth of a mile or a little bit less of a, or whatever of a nautical mile. Lifespan, it's limited. It starts at the bottom, builds up, go, goes, go, the, the heat goes to the top, the source of heat is cut off on the ground, and uh, the, the bubble just ends and the lift dies. Some thermals can have multi-cores, so there could be a few stronger areas within the thermal. So there's a variety of thermaling techniques that can help you center that. Uh, I'm sure we get into them a little bit further in this presentation. Otherwise, they're probably covered in cross-country. So factors that affect thermals. What, what gives you a better thermal? Well, the intensity of surface heating by the sun determines how good the thermal is. 
the, the, the heat hits the ground and is reflected, so therefore if you have haze on the way down, so the, the heat from the sun has to go through a thick layer of haze, it gets uh, weaker and you won't get very good thermals on a hazy day. The same thing goes for if the sky is overdeveloped, and what's meant by that is that you have cloud cover that's going from 6 8 total cover all the way to 8 8 total cover. There's no space for the sun to get through, to hit the earth, to warm the air above it, and for that bubble to come off. This happens sometimes later in the afternoon when it's been a good thermal day and there are lots of cumulus clouds. It overdevelops and almost clouds over. You might have difficulty getting home. Other sources of heat other than the sun, well, the factories will automatically have heat coming off of them, towns, pastures, and one of the reasons that you'll find heat over pastures is probably more the fact that there's moisture in the pasture, which is something I will touch on later, the whole thing about moisture and how new research has come out, which doesn't quite support what we were taught 20 years ago. Fires would be a good source of lift as well. There's energy there. Warming there, things are going up. Uh, the contours of the ground. If you're flying over an area of slopes, etc., or little hillocks, the sunny side of the hill will most definitely have more lift going for it than the side that's on the, on, in the shade or in the cold. Areas of better drainage. Once again, here the the jury is a little bit out on this after some research that was published in, in 2000, January 2016. But essentially here, it takes longer to heat wet ground than it would take to heat or, or dry ground where it will get reflected off quicker. So drier areas should initially get you a thermal quicker. Types of soil really uh, make the difference as well. Crops, surface of the ground, their color and contrast. Light, 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 light crops, light, light soil, good reflector, the energy gets reflected back into the surrounding air and you have a good amount of um, heating of the air over lighter colored crop. So sandy, dry areas, start a thermal a lot quicker. Wet areas, clay areas, yes, they will produce good thermals, but they'll take a lot longer to get to that point, simply because there is the, the, the darker colored soil absorbs more of the heat, and then it takes a while before the heat is pushed off again. Similarly with woods. Woods will take a while to heat up, but once they get going, this is where we have realized only recently is probably where the most lift is generated. Um, so once again, we're talking about dark or light colored. Dark, it takes longer to heat up. Light colored, the heat is bounced into the surrounding air quicker, so thermal activity will happen quicker over light ground than over dark ground. It'll probably last longer over dark ground because the energy it's almost like a battery. You've, you've kind of charged the ground with energy and now it's being released into the atmosphere. Wind will also affect um, thermals. Wind will act as a trigger. Now, extremely high wind, yeah, it's not going to help you very much. It's going to blow that thermal very, very sideways and it's not really going to get height. So just moderate wind will help you on the trigger for, uh, for thermals. Lake effect. Sometimes we get lake effect happening on the coast, on our coasts um, to the north and to the south. It'll generally um, disturb the lift and almost shut out the lift. If there is a lake breeze happening, it is possible, or a sea breeze, it is possible that you'll get convergence of the air mass on the land and the air mass coming from the lake effect line that you'll be able to fly. Um, Kerry and Mike Morganus did that last year and they ended up in yeah, 400 and something kilometers away. I forget, forget the town, Belleville, I think it might have been. They were trying to get to Montreal and that was purely on lake effect. 
Right, let's get to a few more interesting things about thermals, and we call them thermal spacing. So in calm conditions over regular terrain, you'll probably find the spacing between thermals is two to three times the convection height. So let's see what we understand by that. Convection height being the top of the thermal, so the top of the cloud that we see over there, H. So this could be a thousand feet up to here and another thousand feet up to there, so it's two thousand feet, or it could be three thousand here and six thousand to there. Two times six would be twelve plus another half of half of that, so we'd end up at fifteen, fifteen to eighteen thousand feet apart general spacing between clouds. So that's what you'd be flying between. You'd come in over here, zoom up in a thermal over here, get to the top of the thermal, and glide down to here, pick it up over here, and go up again. Once again, from the top of the working band to the bottom of the working band, if you go too far down, it'll take you way too long to get up. The wind then arranges clouds into streets if there's a nice nice uh, bit of wind blowing, and this is, becomes a cloud street. Cloud streets, I'll show you some pictures up a little bit later on cloud streets and how, how they run and what you can do with them. Once again, here we have what happens with the wind's effect on a thermal. As you know, wind closer to the ground is generally slower than wind in the higher altitudes mainly because the friction with the ground, it gets slowed down. So as you get higher, the wind speed increases. Hence, your thermal pops up and gets blown with the wind from a fixed source. So you'd be able to get your lift anywhere in this column from where you think it started to under the cloud. Look at the angle it could be at due to how strong the wind is. So remember that the three cloud might not necessarily always be directly above the source of the thermal. The wind will dictate it. We do know here in, in, in southern Ontario that you could have very little wind on the ground and at 2,000 feet it could be howling at 50 kilometers an hour. That's, that's been found. There's been wind shear here quite often. So the thermal source, once it breaks away from the ground over here, moves with the wind, and now it's kind of underneath it and following it through almost like a hot air balloon. And that's really what you're looking at. It. Your, your thermal source starting here, kicking off a puff, the puff breaking loose, going up, 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 cloud forming, and the next one starts, and there we go. Pulsating thermal source from one place here, particularly on the side of a ridge where it's been warmed up and the wind hits it, and that's your trigger, and off it goes. Cloud streets. They're good fun when they do happen. They look something like that photograph. And if you can get into the upward side of that, close to the cloud, you can go all the way to the end of that street and never have to turn once. Because there will be lift all the way along that street. Much, much fun to fly. For a cloud street to appear, the wind has to be greater than 15 knots. And there has to be a stable layer almost above where the clouds are forming stable cap layer. There's excellent lift under thermal streets, but uh, as I said earlier on, where things are going up, there's also a chance for things to go down. If it's going up somewhere at uh, five knots, it's going down somewhere at five knots, somewhere else. So on the non-sunny side, down one side of the cloud street, there's down going lift. If the wind gets strong enough and blows across the top of these clouds, these clouds can form almost the same as a bunch of series of mountains, little bumps in the sky which form, which cause the air to go up and down and form lee waves above the top of the clouds. We've seen it here once or twice. Uh, if you're flying along a cloud street and you want to get the best out of it, remain within 30 degrees of your course, which is down the center of the cloud street. If you want to go between cloud streets from one street to the next street, remember it's 2.5 to 3 times the top of the cloud base up by it. Do a transition at 90 degrees. Get across as fast as you possibly can. If you can see in the small diagram here, there's lift, lift, lift. Up it comes, and there's sink in between. So there's a rotor, rotor of sink in between there. You've got to get across as fast as possible. 
Um, often beyond the end of the crowd, Cloud Street, there is still this, even though there might not be moisture and the blue extension of the street. Fly out as far as you can, see what you can get out of it. You, you know that if you come back to the Cloud Street, there's going to be left where you last left it. Um, so we get to something, turn point access and exit strategy. If you've got a turn point that's sitting out in the blue, so you've set yourself a task, and it's beyond the, the end of the Cloud Street, remember you need enough altitude to get there and to get back to your source of lift. So it's going to be twice as much, or probably two and a half times as much as what you would need to just get there. Right, here we have, I'll talk a little bit about the optimum speed to fly between clouds on a cloud street to under, under clouds like this. If you're flying from A to B and you're flying fast, you'll probably only get that far. But if you, if you fly in this dolphin pattern where in the sink you speed up, in the lift you, 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 you slow down, you speed up where it gets less strong, you slow down where it gets strong again, you're going to achieve a higher speed than just flying straight point A to point B. This is called dolphin flight. And I think it's important to point out, Tom, that it's not that you're in sync, it's just you're in less lift, right? So in this strong You're in lift, less lift, yes, yeah, thanks, yeah. Right, so in the strong lift, you may be at, let's say, six knots up, and then you get into the weaker lift, with, which is the blue dotted line, or the, or the down of the dolphin flight. You may only be in, let's say, two or three knots of lift, so dive, get through it, so treat it like sink in a way. Yep. So what, what's what's happening here? This guy is, is is flying too slow through a lot less lift. So he's not going to remain at the height and and get the speeds he's looking for. Okay. We also get quite a lot of this over here. In fact, just about everywhere. Blue days. Now there's a day. Beautiful thermals in the sky. Clouds. You can see them. That's because there's enough moisture in the air. The air, of course, gets lifted up to the dew point temperature um, where you get condensation, the condensation height. So on days that are fairly stable or very dry air you'd, or drying air, you don't often get cloud. The thermals are always there. They're as frequent as what they were in a day without the cloud, or with, without the visible cloud to show you where they are. You probably end up having to stumble into them a little bit more than what you would if you knew where they were from the um, from the, the clouds. Once again, follow the terrain. Follow the higher areas, the drier areas, the sun-facing areas. If you get into heavy sink, instead of flying straight through it, just go across the wind to the side and see what happens there. Because, I mean, you're guesstimating where you're going. You can't see anything yet. But it would be fun when we finally do develop a thermal imaging device that will show us what, what, uh, what's going on in the sky. Also, you're probably more dependent on gaggles. Now, I hope you guys know what a gaggle is. A gaggle is a group of gliders that are together in the sky. So there's a bit more group flying on blue days. You might see haze domes appear late in the afternoon. It might help you, but blue days are generally blue days. So when, you fly, when you're flying and you're looking for thermals, a couple of rules that kind of work quite nicely. When you're high up, look towards the sky to see where your next thermal is going to be. In other words, look out for the next cloud and fly towards that cloud and fly to the highest domed area underneath that cloud and to the sunny side and the upwind side of that cloud, that's most likely where you're going to find the lift. So you fly to cumuluses, to wisps in the sky, ahead of you to haze domes in the sky, ahead of you. If you're doing a cross-country task or something like that, don't be afraid to deviate 15 to 20 degrees from your course line as you're trying to find these things, unless you really have to deviate a hell of a lot more because you are going to outland. Look out for birds, look out for debris in the sky, look out for uh, the gliders. So you're still high, you're still nice and high above the ground. You're not really too concerned about where you're going to outland, although as a good pilot, you'll always have had your, your, your field picked at this point in time. 
when you're low, point is looking up into the sky because as, as we, we saw earlier on with the wind, the effect of a wind drifting a thermal downwind with it, you're looking at the cloud above you, you're not going to find it. You've almost got to look on line between where you think the source of the thermal is and where the cloud is. So when you are low, look below. Look for look what's on the terrain. Look for junkyards where the cars piled up and lots of heat being reflected. Hay fields nice and light, heat sources, a fire, somebody doing maple syrup or something like that, maybe somebody doing a barbecue. Who knows, anything that can trigger and start a thermal. Roofs of houses, etc. Smoke, crops. Look at the flags. Look for anything coming up off the ground that might give you some idea. Crops, move, cr movement of crops. You can see a thermal moving through the crops. Suddenly the crop is disturbed and it's almost like as if you it could have been a tornado going through the crop. You could see the line of where that thermal is moving. When there's no crop, when it's an open field, you might see dust devils coming up. That will give you an indication of where that thermal is. Once again, spacing is related to the convection height, so these thermals could be fairly far apart on really good days. Also, you know, mark your previous thermal, remember where it was if you do need to return to it, return to the good thermal and start hunting somewhere else. Now we get to the new information that's come through and this is uh, this was published in the January issue of Siegel Fliegen magazine in Germany. And this was actually sent to me yesterday by my good friend Richard Bieber, whom I spent a week flying rather long tasks in Namibia with in uh, the beginning of December or late November, beginning December. The information in here has come from study of data obtained by people uploading their flights to the OLC and that being analyzed. But before I get on with this, maybe time for just a little open mic session, any questions on thermals up to this point, and then we'll talk about this concept of where the best lift is and stuff that we weren't taught 20 years ago. Okay. It's very different now that they've done proper analysis of what's going on. So I'm just going to unmute everyone. Anybody have any questions? And I got no hands up at the moment. So uh, just unmuted. Has anyone got any questions? Oh, Sweat Van, you yeah, have your hand up. Just a curiosity thing for me. Um, you said Hi. that thermals are generated over light areas, light fields, etc. How is snow uh, in that aspect? Let's say, you know, uh, early in the spring, we manage to get up. There's snow patches and stuff like that in the forest fields. Would that actually generate? An what, 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 have you seen? Have you seen cumulus clouds in the winter? I haven't really paid attention since we started talking about okay. it. <laughs> you know, you know, they are there. They are there. There has to be lift there. And, you know, lift is, lift is really defined as if there's any temperature differential between the air masses. If, it, if one air mass is lighter and warmer, so warmer creates a lighter air mass, more moisture in the air mass also creates even lighter air mass, so it will rise even better. Yes, they have to be thermals in the winter. It must be possible. People are flying in the winter. They're flying in the UK over white terrain. We don't often do it here. SOSA does once a year. Um, normally on the 1st of January do some flying. Do I have music phone? Is that any phone? No. But I didn't know you could record on here. Yeah, voice notes. I'm, I'm going to talk to Mr. Uh, Dane. Hello, okay. Uh, we've got some, somebody really chattering away on an open yeah, mic. Yes, Everybody's sorry. open at the moment. So, okay, let's, let, let, let's mute the mics again if there are no more questions, and I'll get on to this latest discovery from the OLC. I have, I have. Oh, sorry. I think I just, Svetvan, sorry, I just muted you just as you started to talk. Go ahead. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I'm unmuted again. Uh, I have one question about uh, really the decision for, for leaving the thermal, that that's also important, especially when the thermal is too strong and you need to follow your course, what is the, the best spot where you leave the thermal, right? It all depends on the wind as well. 
So where do it all, it all, it all depends on the wind and it all depends on technique. And I believe I am coming up to thermal exit very soon, which I know David disagrees with, and we can talk on a variety of ways of exiting a thermal. The main thing you have to do is do not get sucked up into the cloud, whatever you do. Right. And by getting sucked into the cloud, when you can't see what you're doing, and you have to speed up so fast that you exceed v and &E, &E, you don't want to do that either. So there are ways of pre preventing that. Don't go all the way to the top. And, and Svetvan, just to add to that, we, we alluded to the working band earlier. And if you remember to Tom's earlier discussion, you talked about how the lift is weak down low. It gets strong in the center. And then as you get closer to the cloud, it actually gets weaker again. So what, what like good contest pilots do and good cross-country pilots do is they figure out what the working band is. And then they stay within that band. So let's say, for example, uh, the cloud base is at, at 6,000 feet above the ground. And you figure out that the working band is actually between three and 5,000 feet. So what you would do is you would enter the thermals at about 3,000 ideally, work them up to 5,000. When you get to 5,000, don't continue because the, the lift starts to weaken. You, you, you pop out of the thermal. So you're wasting time though. Yeah, so that you pop out of the, the thermal then and go to the next one. And that's what the whole working band concept is about. Right. Yeah, my question was really more uh, in regards which which side of the thermal you leave the thermal. So right. The okay, right. Wind, like... so, so that's coming up. That's okay, coming up in, 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 in a queue. And there's, there's, as I say, there's discussions over that, etc. But yeah, I'll, I'll go through that in a second. Okay. All right. So, sorry. No, no problem at all. So, so getting back to the results of the study that were done on flights on the OLC, all the flights that were analyzed were in excess of a thousand kilometers. So these are <coughs> real long distance flights. Um, they did, did analysis of where the thermals were picked up and came to a conclusion that there's a long hidden secret and that is humidity. The more moist the air is, the better the thermal because the more water moisture in the air mass, the lighter that air mass is. Without humidity, there is no upgrade, no lifting air. One acre of forest, believe it or not, evaporates 50,000 liters of water on a sunny day. It was found that the lift is best over the forest, as you can see from this diagram over here. The air gets humid, hot, creates a bubble, and starts rising. You know, that's pretty normal. Hot air becomes as hot as the ambient air, but stays humid and is therefore lighter than all the air around it. Thus, it has to rise. So, we'll see here if they started giving numbers to thermal strengths from different areas. So, we were talking about a power station, for example. I'll give you a factor of one, number one lift. A city, lots of houses, roofs, etc. We was giving. 7% of the time or whatever it was in the, in the factor. So this is what 182 instances of lift that we're looking at over here. Sorry, so seven of those were over, over cities and these are now 1,000 kilometer flights. 24 of that 182 was sitting over just normal fields, um, wheat fields, etc., acreage, you know, uh, clear, cleared land, etc. And look what happens. Thermals picked up on the edge of a forest. 45 out of those 182 thermals were found over the edge of the forest. In the middle of the forest, they were finding 65 of the 182. And on the far side, 40. This shows a very interesting trend that there is, yes, very good lift over forests, which we did not think was the case. I was definitely not taught that. Now, the one thing I have to say uh, about forests is if you're going to fly out over a forest, make damn sure you have enough height to come back from once you're in the middle of that forest and you haven't found the lift. Always, always remember that because there are very few outlanding areas over here as opposed to over the fields. So, OLC analysis shows 80% of good thermals were over the forests. And this is not what we learned decades ago, definitely not. We were taught now there's no lift over forest. Now what we have found here, and I found this and quite a few other pilots have found it in the late afternoon, 
the forests will actually save you on the way home. There's always good left there. They're like storage batteries. They take a long time to, to warm up and then they last well into the afternoon. Um, once again, I reiterate, the humidity is the driving factor. The forests are more humid. The air is lighter, hence the air rises easier. And the humidity is bunkered down in the forests. That's where the humidity is. The forests keep the humidity in. Hey, Woody Advantage in Canada, we have lots of forests. We should be having fun over these forests. Just as a, once again, caution, be able to get out of it. So let's have a look at uh, types of lift. We've just, I wonder why this slide popped into where it is at the moment. Have I gone back to the beginning of this? We've looked at thermic lift on the side here. Now we're looking over here at orographic lift and wave lift. This image popped in here, and I have no idea where it popped in, but it will probably change into something better over here. Here we go. Here's a glider. Let's see where it starts. And this, this is almost like the pictures you see on CU after you analyze your flight. Here's a cloud over here. Here comes the glider. Whoops, into lift. Up, 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 up. Reaches the top of the working band and goes off to the next cloud that it believes is a good cloud. Hits the lift. Up, 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 up. Now uh, to the bottom of the next cloud, and that's what we do. That's what we do all the way long, flying thermal to thermal to thermal. Little thing, a little, little bit about safety in thermals. The first glider that goes into the thermal and decides to turn in whichever direction it wants to turn, although it should try and turn counter the direction in which the thermal itself is rotating for better lift. But that first glider sets the direction of the thermal. So if you're coming into another thermal, join and follow the same direction, either left-hand turn, right-hand turn. Look out underneath a good cloud. There's bound to be another glider there. Keep a nice spacing between yourself and the other gliders. If there are two gliders in the thermal, 90 degrees to each other, so you can see each other's eyeballs over the end of the wingtip. You don't want to be hunting for each other. Don't fly too close. Um, things happen very quickly. Somebody, you too close to another glider. That glider, for example, flies just a little bit too close to the stall, hits the stall, drops a couple of hundred feet or a hundred feet straight into you. Not a good thing. Say hello to the other pilot in the thermal. Use your radio. Wave. You know, make sure you see each other. Talk about it. So here we have the spiral approach to getting into a gaggle. Here's a glider already set its course in the cell. It's doing left-hand turns. Here you come in, flying in at high speed, and you pull up into the thermal and follow it around and start spacing yourself opposite the other glider. And that's how you get into the, into the thermal. So here you've got a lot of potential um, energy, as we spoke about before. Right, right, uh, let's try and put this pen on. I haven't used the pen today. It could be fun. You've got potential energy over here, and now you're converting it in the up going here into kinetic energy. You're slowing down, and now you're meeting the thermal speed of the other glider at the top there. Leaving a thermal. So you've been sitting in this thermal, flying up, 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 closer to the, to the um, cloud base. You do not want to get into cloud base. You might have reach the end of what you've deemed to be the working band, say you're only interested in three knots and above on that particular day. When it gets to 2.9 knots, you say, time to get out. There's better stuff somewhere else. You leave in the direction of where you want to go. Do not fly 90 degrees to, your, to where you think your next turn point is. So you need to know where it is. If you can decide that your next turn point happens to be down here in this direction over here, you fly in to the far end of the thermal and come back through the thermal, speeding up through the thermal so that you can at least get your potential or you, you convert some of your kinetic energy back into potential energy so that you have the correct speed to fly in the sink area. And that's really how easy it is to leave the thermal. Go in the direction that you want to go. Make sure you know where that is. You can get pretty disoriented the first few times that you film and you won't know where Alice is compared to Tottenham. So keep that in mind. And I'm I'm just gonna chime in um, if I absolutely may. and we can open up 
mic because we're about to go into or a graphic lift and maybe we'd yep. like to take a break here as well. I, I think this would be a perfect spot for break. So the other way to leave a thermal is to simply level your wings while you're in that turn and just, just fly straight on out. So you're not actually doing this extra steep pull up bank turn dive through. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. Something so just, like that from exact, that point. Yeah. So, so what you would do is just, is just keep flying your circle and then all you do is you just level your wings and, and just fly out. Now, the, the trick here, much as Tom was talking about, is do it at the right time so that the heading you pick up is the heading you want. Now, two, two cautions with the pull up and, and head out across the center, the first of which is you're already flying relatively slowly. There, there's a better drawing. Um, you're already flying relatively slowly in the thermal, so be cautious that you don't you know, pull up and get into a, a stall spin situation, which has happened. And second, if you're in a gaggle, uh, especially if there's another glider opposite you at the same level, um, do not use this exit because the potential of the midair collision is extremely high. So um, if you feel comfortable, give it a try, do it when no one's around, you know, you know, build that skill set. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, just level your wings and fly out on the heading you want. Thank you, Tom. All right, so let's 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 open this up for a couple of questions. If anybody has any on thermals, or want to ask questions, want to tell stories. I, I like I like the the exit on the gaggle, the safety precaution there, David. Um, I totally get that. Uh, but I like I like the I like the, the the go up high and come down if you're by yourself. I think it's a little more I don't know, a little more playful, a little uh, more exciting than, than just. Uh, you know, just like the accent. Oh, it's called it's elegant. Elegant is the word. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Van, you had a yeah. question. When, when you're flying in a gaggle? Yeah. Oh, Jim, yes. Go ahead. Um, again, it, communication is, is critical. So if you decide to leave, it's always nice just to say, you know, leave in thermal now. So don't be afraid to use your, your radio just to let the other people know what you're doing, what your intentions Good point. Yep. Uh, we're good. Tom, okay, you mentioned right. we should be we should be flying the thermal in the opposite direction of the rotation of the thermal, right? Yes, but now you're flying into wind going. Right. You, you're flying into the wind, which is always better lift. Now, how you determine that, I have exactly. no idea. <laughs> you might find a bird, and the bird has probably got it right. Most of the time, they have. You might find a piece of plastic bag, God forbid, but rather maybe a leaf or something going past, and you'll see the direction it's moving in. If it's a whirlwindy type thing, you know, um, a stable that you can see from the ground, generally you can see the direction of the turn of that thing. That's okay. fine. But most of them you can't really see in the air. Yeah, I, I, turkey, I, turkey vultures, turkey vultures, eagles, hawks. They've got to figure out seagulls. They'll go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't follow yeah. seagulls. They're idiots. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and do not do not, <laughs> do not follow a stork. A stork is also a completely useless animal to follow. I, uh, I see Diane Bradley has her hand up. Diane. Yeah, that's me actually. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I had um, I had, I had problems well, with my uh, well. This, I've got an explanation for that, but I won't waste time I love on that. Your I'm just voice, David. Uh, so I've got, I've got flu. Got flu. I went to Aruba and I got flu. All right. Nice. Svetvan, you you uh, want terrific. You got something? Yeah, yes. I was just going to say. Well, I was, I was uh, you know, I was just wondering. I've never seen this exit strategy before. Uh, just wondering what the rationale, even assuming it's safe to do so. Uh, of, um, I'm just trying to figure it. Is it to give you a lot of energy to to give you more it's, distance it's, when you leave the thermal? It's got, to, it's got to do with as you're coming up here, you're flying at your 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 thermic speed. You coming around. You're still climbing over here, but now you're on the back of the thermal. You've got lift over here, lots of lift, all the way through yeah. here, lots of lift. So you're not really doing a chandelle. You're not doing it. Much. Like a chandelle. It, it, you're coming it along. Like and, chandelle, yeah. Well, here with the rest of the band would be here, right? Something like that. You'd be yeah. going up. 
basically you're coming off the top and you're flying back through the center of lift but accelerating through it. Right. So, so, so is, now is you're that getting a, to um, your... Yeah. You, you get, you, once you've exited the thermal, you're now in the downgoing air over here. You are traveling at, um, at the speed that your MacReady is asking of you to fly in sync. It's all I got it. So it, it gives you that that speed to get through the sink. Otherwise, if yeah, you so, so you're level, not entering yeah. the sink. If you come, if you're coming out here, you're doing your th your thermal speed, and now you're dead slow through the sink. Now you're going to lose a ton of altitude over of here course, of before course. you get to yeah. speed again. And that's all it is. So yeah. instead of doing that curve over here, you're doing it here. But here it's through upgoing air, and here it's through downgoing air. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so you're leaving yeah, the of I got it. it. gives you speed. Yeah, it gives you energy to get across yeah. the sink or the, uh, yeah, the lack so, of... So the, the theory is that as you cross through the center of the thermal, you get that extra little boost up to, to help boost, you know, yeah. use every last... No, what, what, what you're getting is you're getting, you're getting the extra air speed without losing altitude. That's really what sure. you're doing. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. okay, thanks for that. Any, okay. Anyone else with okay. any questions? I I had one which is probably irrelevant for this type of aircraft, but uh, let's say it's a windy day. You have highly inclined thermal, which you've been chasing for the last many minutes, right? So at one point you have to leave it. Uh, on which side of the thermal you leave? You leave on the upwind or you leave with the wind? So I, I'm not sure if my English is good enough to say to explain what I'm asking. Okay, so so let let, let me rephrase that for you. Which direction do you mm -hmm. want to go after you've left the thermal? So that that really is my question because my flying experience is with a different. I'm asking you a different question. Just listen carefully to what I'm asking. Are you planning to go somewhere or are you just joyriding? No, I'm planning, planning, planning to go somewhere. So, then so you will exit, what is what is the most in. efficient what is the most efficient path? Should I lightly stray away just to to keep my altitude, uh, but leave the thermal at the other point than my direction, or I should just uh, keep if if the, at all if at all possible you will leave the thermal as described here through the point of highest lift in the direction that you want to go in. I don't know. I I wouldn't say. You've got to fly out through the sunny side of the thermal, then do a 90 degree turn to get to where you want to go to. I would go out in the direction that I want to go in, or the direction of the next piece of lift that you hope to find. You're always going for the next cloud, and in the direction of where you're going, within 15 degrees either side of the center of the track. Oh, okay, let, let let me just change the question a bit. Where is more sink? Because you said that whenever it's left, there is sink. Uh, on the side where the wind is inclining the thermal, or on, on the shade side of the thermal? Where is the sink? There, there, there is more, more sink generally on the shady side of the thermal as opposed to the sunny side. You'll find the lift mostly on the sunny side of the cloud and also on the wind side of the cloud. So you're going to find more sink on the downwind of the cloud and on the mm. shade of the cloud. Okay. okay. So okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that you're going to gain enough going in the wrong direction to get away from the heavier sink than you would if you made a more direct route. Yeah, that, that, you know, okay. I, 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 okay, so, so I, I, I think your, your, your best is take the most direct route between where you are and where you want to go, unless, you know, you know, stepping a mile to the right puts you into lift, right? Yeah, um, unless you're going to fly straight straight through a thunderstorm or a rain cloud. Or, or yeah, or something <laughs> like that, absolutely, or you know, a mountain. Um, but, yeah, I, I would say that if you've got, you know, op open open terrain, uh, you've just got a bunch of puffy cumuluses randomly dotted around the sky, I don't think you're going to gain enough by going in the wrong direction to avoid the slightly higher sink that is on one side of the thermal versus the other. Um, you know, as, as Tom just started to say, go try it. Go fly it and see what you think. You know. <laughs> it's something yeah. you'll, you'll, you'll learn as you go. Yeah. 
So so and then take your GPS and your 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 OLC and your your ICG files and track it all and then do some analysis and maybe you'll be writing an article for that German magazine in five years. Okay. Well, really, that that was my so just question. Just on a this, uh, note on. Sorry, Svetvan. Yeah, that ahead. was really my question because from my other flying experience, that is it, it has a significant importance when and how you leave the thermal because you really may lose as much as you gain in the last 10 minutes. Now, uh, now but you're, this you're is really very low, low speed flying, right? So really my question was how relevant is that to the higher speed flying what is it like? Okay, so, so, so one, give us give us an indication how you would leave a thermal in a hang glider. Uh, hang glider is also relatively higher speed than what I'm coming from. So the, well, how but, you would, uh, what are you, what are you whatever you're coming from? You can paraglider? That, but yeah, with the paraglider you really leave with the wind. You leave on the shady okay. side, and you're really chasing okay. the next one, and you step on it. But uh, again, the speeds there are, are a lot lot lower than what it is with the glider. And and you yeah, I think we I think, I think. Is, <coughs> the glide ratio is about seven there where where with the glider is like thirty six and there is this is what I'm trying to get. Yeah, I, I get the impression probably with hang gliding or with 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 uh, parasailing you tend to be moving a little bit more with the wind as into yeah, the wind. Yeah. It's not like you. Yeah. So okay, things are different in it's the gliding. You have much more. Yeah. So okay, yeah. I don't want to just to stray away more from that. So All right. So so concluding the section on on thermal flying, um, when Richard Bieber and myself were flying in, yeah, we eventually came to realize that all the little pans and the pan is a small, dried up, almost dried up dam, were creating and starting all the thermals that we were flying over. So we'd literally fly from pan to pan to pan, which were also our only places that we could outland on. So that whole story of the humidity being a great help um, for thermal activity and better thermals holds very true. The only time it breaks down is if it gets swelteringly wet, like it sometimes gets here in southern Ontario, and the performance of the aircraft break down completely in that. You know, tow plane can't get off the ground, etc. We spoke about that last week. So time for a ten minute break and we'll get yep. back to orographic lift. Awesome. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna mute everyone and um, Tom if you don't have any graphic I'll put up a little quick video while we're on break. Sounds good? Yeah I'll put up a video, put up a clock. Thanks David. All right. See you in a bit. Oh, I need to share my screen. Make presenter, there we go. Show my screen, there we go. It's going to start that.
Okay, we're just coming back online, and um, I was just, I picked up a new book uh, when I was in the um, AGM in Montreal called Advanced Soaring Made Easy, and um, I was just flipping through it while we were on, on break there, and I found an interesting picture that talks about the effect of strong winds on thermals that I thought I would share with you, so let me just pull it up here. My, uh, oh, there we go, good. There it is. Okay, let me just let me just pause this for a second here. Just gonna get rid of that and go back to where I was. There it is. Okay. Um, so they were talking about how the core of the thermal gets here, the wind sort of elongates it and pushes it out, and then we get into that that sink. And if I'm reading this correctly. It sounds like this part is the strong sink because it's concentrated, and then this is is less concentrated. So I'm just going to unmute everyone. Tom, you there? Okay, so Tom, you're unmuted. I'm just going to work through everyone yeah, else. Yeah, I think I think what you're seeing here is the screen part is the strong thermal core. Yeah. Um, and then the sink is weaker there, and oh, the thermal is. So there was sink on the outside, so it's become oval shaped due to the wind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, so I've unmuted everyone. Welcome back. Um, Jim, you had your hand up. Oh, someone's got music going on back there. Could be me. <laughs> All right. Um, Jim Miller, you had your hand up a moment ago. It's me. No, uh, Jim, I think, has actually dropped off. Uh, Dave, Bradley, you have your hand up at the moment. Do you need anything? Um, I, I had a question before, but I've forgotten it because I didn't realize. I, I thought I'd put my hand down. <laughs> it must have been right at the end of the last session. Uh, I have a lot of technical questions about this um, webinar, but I'll speak to you yeah, later so about that. Yeah, so you, you and I will take care of that yeah, offline. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to lower that yeah. hand. And, uh, if we're good to go, I'm going to mute yeah. everyone. And again, if you do have a question, raise your hand and back over to Tom. Okay, Tom, back okay. over. Okay, thank you. I'm unmuted now. Um, what you see on the screen, do you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, David, we can sorry, see. I'm we, not sure if you guys see my screen. We can see your Kobo. Okay, this is, um, just wanted to show you this, this is a picture of, of the Glide computer sitting on a Kobo in the back seat of an, oh god, what was it, EB2028 in Namibia. Um, this is what I was talking about, the GPS signal that this thing was received, it's receiving it via Wi-Fi from my Android phone, perfectly good for navigation. All right, let's move on. Talking about orographic lift, the different form of lift, lift that we can harness when wind blows onto an object or a shape, so it's a deflection of wind, up or over a ridge, over a mountain, even possibly over the side of a big building, over the top of a cloud, you know, that cloud that's there, that piece of puffy moisture there really is a small mountain in the sky that can create the upgoing air over that as well. Uh, for this to work properly on proper orographic or proper, proper geographic areas, the wind has to be anything from perpendicular to the ridge, so directly onto the ridge, up to 20 to 30 degrees from either side of 90 onto that ridge. Otherwise, you don't really get proper ridge lift. The shape of the ridge is also very important. If it's concave, if you have two peaks or two juts coming out and there's a rounded area going into the mountainside or the ridge side, it creates a funnel and the wind will blow up that funnel. Whereas if, if it's pointing outwards, the air will be pushed away from that in the convex of the bowl. So you're going to get greater lift in the funnel itself. Um, any cross ridges that you happen to have will also have an inference on the on the on the on the, on, the, on, the, on the strength of the lift. Uh, so that's long out jutting areas, the ends of a ridge, 
particularly down in uh, Pennsylvania, when you get to the end of the short sections of ridge, there's normally what they call the gap there, the Altoona gap. What's that? I can't remember what the other gaps are over there. Um, your lift will die out over that. It'll kind of want to go around the mountain as opposed to over because going around is easier. Uh, on the far side of the ridge, or the far side of the mountain, when the wind has gone over the top of the mountain, it starts going down and it starts curling and you get um, rotor forming there. It's a really, really strong sink on the side of a ridge. Any orographic lift is always pretty turbulent and a little unpredictable depending on what the wind's doing. If the wind's nice and constant and steady, then at least you know it's going to be there. Now you've got to take into consideration the fact that the terrain is changing shape, so that changes the predictability there. There's always, where there's strong lift, there's always strong down, down going lift, and it can be pretty damn turbulent flying mountains or ridges. There, of course, are thermals that get triggered from the sun shining on the side of the mountain, and you can get thermic activity mixed in with the orographic lift or the air that's being forced up due to the shape of the, the ground in which it's moving. You almost all the time when you're flying a ridge, and particularly Pennsylvania Ridge, which is the closest one to us over here, you're always flying fairly low. You are maybe 50 to 100 feet, maybe 200 feet above the ridge at times. If you can get to 1,000 feet above the ridge, and as a beginner, I would suggest you stay at least 1,000 feet over the ridge for your comfort zone. But as you progress, you'll find you're flying faster and lower over the at low altitude over the ridge, uh, which means your options for outlanding come up a hell of a lot quicker than what they would when you were three or four thousand feet above the ground. So you really have to be looking out for your outlanding fields. And the Pennsylvania Ridge is there. The outlanding fields are a little bit few and far between. It's fairly narrow valleys over there. Normally, 90% of the time, there'll be a pretty pretty strong crosswind because your um, runway will be running down the valley, the length of the valley, to get the length that you need for a runway. And the wind, of course, will be howling directly across at 90 degrees at a good 30 knots or 25 knots or whatever because that's when it really starts working, 15 to 25 knots. Um, you'll do a crosswind takeoff interesting times when that happens, so you have to hone your skills on that. So let's have a look at what this really looks like. If we look at this picture over here, we've got wind coming in at 90 degrees into the valley. So it's coming up in, uh, I'll find my pen over here. It's coming up in this direction, going up and being bounced off of the mountain and forced upwards. Now what you'll find is you'll get a working band of lift that is not directly above the ridge of the mountain. It'll be forward of the ridge, just a little bit forward of the, at the top of the ridge, and it'll be on an inclined plane over here to the mountain, as you can see. The higher up, the more into the valley you'll be when you're flying the lift on the ridge. The lower down, the closer to the ridge you'll be. That's kind of the... the um, the slope you have over there, there's an angle over here between those two parts. This is a diff different representation of all of that. There comes the wind howling in onto the mountain, getting forced up. This long one here, the same piece of air has the same or a longer distance to travel than the top one, so you're going to increase the speed across the bottom here higher wind speeds as it slows down over the top and you get your area of convection or upgoing air over there ahead of the front of the lift. As I mentioned before, on the far end, there's down going air and that down going air can quite happily knock you out. Now let's take that same type of drawing and look at it with scallops in the, in, in the ridge. So we're talking here about the concave, and the concave areas being these areas over here, and the convex areas here. So the bulges in the ridge, 
the air gets forced off the bulge into the center and up over here. Same thing there. So your best lift is in these bulges over here. Your areas of lesser lift are along here. And over here, you're probably going to find very little lift around that area over there. This is with the wind at, say, 20 degrees to the, to the, to the edge of the valley, maybe even more per perpendicular to the valley. So you, you've got the funneling effect of the wind there. You know where to go and find your areas of stronger lift. Now let's say we take that very self-same lift and turn it even more oblique. Now it's going to come along here, and I get the silly pen thing on again. I don't know if I have it on. Um, it's going to come along in here and hit this ridge that we see over here, and you're going to have it slowing down. Not going to get as good lift as there. So this kind of gives you a, a more oblique um, or this the ridge. Instead of getting strong lift all the way up here, it's slightly stronger as it hits across the top of that crest over there, and weaker, weaker in the other areas. Some more representation. I found this in a lovely document called the FAA Glider Flight Handbook. Quick scan over it today on the web. Fairly well put together. So free for download off the FAA site. Wind coming in across onto a mountain gets pushed up a mountain. You get areas of lift sitting in this line over here. So you've got lift on the front of the mountain. You've got horrible down going air in the back of the mountain. Let's say you have a plateau. So there's no way for the air to go down even further. It starts forming rotors on the back here. This is dangerous area, the rotor area. Um, very difficult to fly and very unpredictable. Here we have an example down here of scallops mountains. There's a bunch of mountains. So you're going to hit a rotor in behind each one of these baby peaks as the air goes all the way up there. Things to watch out for, the little valleys in between where the lift is. So if we have orographic lift and we have thermic activity happening at the same time. This is the type of picture you're going to be seeing. The sun's coming down here and is warming this area of the mountain up quite nicely, warming the ground up over here as well. The wind's nice and strong and it triggers the lift. The lift gets bumped up over the mountain and yet continues in its bubble further up in this direction. So you could possibly hit the lift over here and suddenly be thermaling over here on the far side of the mountain. Remember, there is a portion of air that still goes down here. So hopefully, you've caught the section within the bubble. So that that is also a possibility when you have the mixture of um, orographic lift and thermic on a mountain slope. Safety on the ridge. Okay, you're flying along the ridge, and two aircraft are coming head on. So if in normal, in, 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 in normal flying, two aircraft coming head on will divert to the right. Am I correct in that, David? Sorry, say again. I was just reading an email. Sure. No, two, two, two aircraft head on all the course to the right. So you divert to the right. So let's say you're flying yes. along the ridge with your right wing pointing at the, uh, at the ridge. Do you have anywhere to go to? Can you divert to? No, you can't. Yeah. You're going to fly into the mountain. So aircraft with the right wing to the ridge has right of way. So if you're flying with your right wing to the ridge or to the mountain slope, you've got nowhere to go to in the normal, no normal way of diversion to the right. The aircraft coming towards you has to divert and allow you through on the inside. So aircraft with the right wing to the ridge has right of way. Aircraft passing on the aircraft always pass each other on the inside of the ridge. So if you're the faster aircraft, you get in between the slower aircraft and the ridge when you pass. That's another rule of flight safety on the ridge. And Tom, why Biggest is rule that? Of all, look out! Look out! Oh, 
did we lose Tom? Oh, help me, David. I don't know. What do I want to be an answer if you ask the question? Um, sorry, your, your audio is coming in and out a little bit. Um, so why would the aircraft pass on the inside? What would be the reason uh, for that? Well, once, once again, the aircraft that has to divert or could divert will divert to the outside. The aircraft flying along the ridge and wanting to maybe double back on the ridge won't turn in towards the mountain. will always turn away from the mountain to make its turn. Right. So, so when you're flying along, along it's really the edge of a mountain, you never turn into the mountain. You always fly a figure eight in and out. Um, you know what? Should I try and move it to the other head, to the other microphone? Stand by. Sure. Um, so just just to kind of fill that in, sure. if I'm flying along the ridge, if I'm going to make a turn, I'm going to make that turn away from the ridge. So if you're coming up from behind me, I cannot see you. I don't know you're there. And if you go to pass me, by passing on the inside, the only turn I'm going to make is away from the ridge. So if I do make an unexpected turn while you're in the process of passing me, I'm going to be turning away from you. And that's the, the logic behind that. Um, Dave Bradley's just raised his hand. So, Dave, what's up? Yeah, yeah I, I, I haven't heard of that. Because I've done a certain amount of ridge flying a long time ago. I was based in Wales uh, as a tow, tow pilot. And uh, I've never heard of that one where you... I, I know the rationale of being, being at a higher speed if you're close to the ridge because it gives you more energy to get yourself out of trouble yep. if anything goes wrong. But, so, so um, the passing I, on the inside? I've never, yeah, the passing on the inside, first of all, I've never heard of that, but that, that's, not, you know, that's maybe because I haven't heard of it. But um, the, the, what worries me about that kind of uh, procedure is if you're passing someone else uh, and, you just, and you move to the in between him and the ridge, and say he's unaware that you're there, and he decides to wander a little closer to the ridge, without knowing you're there, you know that someone else is passing him. You could be in a lot of trouble, basically. Uh, so have to like, he has you know. right, right. So the the thing is, though, Tom or uh, uh, Dave. Dave. Someone's never yeah. going to turn into the ridge. Now, when you go to no, pass, no, no, that, 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 yeah, right. When you go to pass, um, it's right. Right. Let's park, let's park this one and talk about it afterwards. Okay. Let can okay. we do that, Dave? Is that good okay. for you? Yep. I think we 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 yeah, don't. And and I'm just I, as soon as we've gone through this, we'll have a discussion afterwards. Okay. I'll and try I'm, and make a note of asking okay, that okay, again later. Yeah, yeah. Great. Because I but, think it could be quite important actually at some point. Yeah, and, and, and it has been thought through and everything. So I'm just going to mute you. And Tom, um, Men Mendaika, uh, you have your hand up. What's up, Tom? have your hand up. What's up, Tom? Yeah, sorry, just a quick question. Is there like a protocol or anything accepted whether, you know, it's preferred to fly right wing or left wing to the ridge, on like being on the road the left or right hand side of it? No, it's, that's all based on the direction. That's all based on the direction you're heading. So, okay. so if you've got a ridge so that runs north south, what you're going to do is you're going to run up you're gonna the gonna north. Gonna north. Gonna Run up north. Your right, your right wing is going to be to the right. Wing's turn around, to yeah. the around, the right. So, but if we're looking, if we're looking for a point of lift, let's say we're just going towards the left, uh, towards the ridge to gain some lift. Uh, is left. there a preferred side left. in which somebody would head? No, no, there's not. And I'm, no. I'm going to turn it back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to turn it back over to Tom because what he's coming up, I think, will explain that. Coming up, I think, explain that. Okay, thank you. Tom, Tom, are you back with us? Tom Robertson. All right. There you are. I'm back. Can you hear me this time? Can yes. you hear me? It's sounding much better. Hello, David. Okay. So the, the main takeaway from this is, um, and Tom and Dyke, if you're flying north along the ridge and the ridge is on your, your right-hand side, you'll have your right wing to the ridge. When you decide to turn around, you're going to have your other wing to the ridge. Simple as that. Um, there is no preferred side in which wing to have to the ridge. Okay, looking out, big, big lookout, always look out on mountains. You're coming around a corner and around one of those bulges, etc. You don't know what's on the other side. Beware what's going on there. Definitely keep your eyes open. Now, let's see. All turns are made away from the ridge. Never turn in towards the ridge. There won't be enough space for you to make that turn. So if you're flying and trying to get 
lift on the face of the ridge, you start doing figure eights. You're flying, let's say you're flying right wing to the ridge and you get to the end of the lift, you take a turn to the left and you come back in on a figure eight and now you're flying with your left wing to the ridge and you go down to where the lift ends and turn it around figure eights again away from the ridge. Keep extra speed on board. Very, very important. As I showed you earlier on, when the wind is coming obliquely across bulges in the ridge, there is a decrease in lift. I have personally come across between or a little valley on a, on a ridge coming out of that on a 10,000 foot high mountain and had absolutely no control once I had gone through the other side. I came through at 90 kilometers an hour, which is just a bit faster than thermic speed, came through the, the gap in the, in, 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 the, in the mountain and had no control on the other side. I had a stirring butter with my, with my stick. It took a while. All that, all that came to mind is stick slightly forward so that when you do regain control, you also regain speed and you need that speed to control. The next fun part that you get, or fun way of flying, is when it's called wave. And this is also an orographic form of lift. And it happens when wind is blowing fairly strongly off the top of a plateau into a valley, for example. Very much, yeah, the terrain as I've spoken about there. So really an obstacle with a relatively steep lee side. So you coming, the wind's coming off the top of the plateau, dropping into, say, a canyon or something. That's the steep lee side we're talking about. The obstacle itself on the, over the top of which the air is flowing is relatively flat, surface smooth, the wind can speed up should be nice and long so that you have good wind speed and the obstacle itself should be perpendicular to the to the wind. And then of course if you have further obstacles down when you start the propagation of wave properly. So you've got to, got to have wind, you've got to have a stable air mass and wind speeds of at least 15 knots. And and above. And the higher, the better, but also the more rotor. Constant wind in the layer, which helps, you, helps it all. Wind speed yeah. increases with altitude. That's due to less surface friction as the wind gets away from the surface. Yes? Tom, we have, uh, Chris Andrews has his hand up. Sorry, somebody gonna, came in there? Yeah, me. It's, uh, Chris Andrews has his hand up. I'm just going to mute him for a sec. Chris, you had a question? Hi, guys. Uh, I just wanted Tom, to illustrate in the form of a diagram when um, passing a glider in ridge lift. Um, I just want to get that straight. Uh, if you could go back a couple slides, thanks. Oh, so the, the passing on the inside piece. Correct. Okay. Tom, do you have something for that? No, I don't. Um, I could draw it up on the slide. I could draw it up on the corner of this one. I could go back a few slides yeah. if we want to. Let let let's let's park that and let's let's put something together so that we can we can properly review that at the beginning of next session. How's that sound? Well, Chris, you know, it's it's the same question that David was asking. Yeah. So let's let let's see if we can finish it at the end of this session with a little diagram. Okay. That's okay. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, am I back on again? Are we continuing with the discussion on passing a glider on the inside? No, you're back on. We'll we'll address that at the very end if we have time. Otherwise, we'll we'll park it till next session. Okay. No, it was always time. Okay, so wind speed increases with altitude. Indications that you're going to get waveforming. The air is generally very dry, uh, um, and if there is moist air, you'll find lenticular clouds forming. Now, lenticular cloud, lenticular means bean-shaped. They're little clouds that form where the wave is, and these clouds do not move, even though there is a wind speed in excess of 15 knots blowing. The cloud remains the same side. The air mass is lifted up to that altitude. The front of the little lenticular is nicely defined and nice and clear, and the trailing edge of it is a little bit more furry, and that's where the down going air is, so the moist air is forced down again, and uh, it, it's no longer condensed, and you don't see it anymore. 
Here is just a little diagram of how this all works. You've got, I'm going to get my pen here, you've got wind coming in from this side, this direction, hitting this mountain over here. And dropping over the back, dropping down, hitting the ground and being bounced up again, creating the rotor over here as it rolls over, and going down again, hitting the ground and bouncing up the mountain shape. And so as with altitude, this is and there your limbs where your softly vocular just go wee and nothing else. You just keep going up until you get yourself into this zone over here underneath the lenti where the, it is dead quiet, it is not turbulent at all, it is fine with Tom, I just gonna That's have right. to Tom, I'm just gonna have to poke in for a second here. Um, your no, audio is on a calm day. There is no noise. Hello, Tom. And all that happens is you're going up. Yeah. Uh, your audio is really breaking. Yep, up. I can hear. Yeah, Tom, you there? Yes. Um, hello. Your your audio is really breaking up. We barely heard any of that whole wave description piece. Um, I don't know if you if you can change your internet connection or or um, if you've got some other things running in the background that maybe are, are interfering. Um, if if you can restart that wave description would be great. I'm going to have to see if I can find somewhere else to move to that might be better with the internet. Can you hear any of that? That was all very clear, actually. <laughs> okay, well let's try. Some things happen. Maybe my yeah. daughter's got off the internet. Ah, there you go. Okay, which should we try and restart this one? Yeah, just start at the beginning of the slide. Would be great. Okay, so you guys are good over there. You can hear me now. Well, loud and clear now. Whatever you did was working. All right, I'm shouting. I'm shouting. I'm going to get another beer out and shout louder. <laughs> okay, you got you got wind coming in in this direction, being bounced into the mountain. It's a long, flat mountain over here. It gets forced up and forced over the mountain. It goes down the back of the mountain in the lee, hits the ground and gets bounced up again. And the same thing happens continually as it goes down. And if you have more mountains downstream of the main mountain, you get your primary wave forming here, your secondary wave forming here, your tertiary wave there, your quaternary, etc. as you go down. The wind speed increases with height, the lift gets better with height, there's tremendous rotor over here in this direction and tremendous rotor over here in this direction down. So tons of sink over here, tons of lift over here. As you can see from the diagram, the lift is in this band over here. So let's just clear that slide, a little bit of all that ink. You've got lift over here, fabulous lift underneath there. You go up as you get underneath the shape of the cloud in this zone here. The lift becomes extremely smooth. You're out of the rotor. It is like going up on silk. There is no sound in the glider. It is dead, dead quiet. All the Vario is doing is going bee -dee -bee -dee -bee -dee -bee in a high pitch howl. And you could be climbing at five meters a second, which is ten knots up, and literally not even hearing it. Um, I have on one occasion been underneath a wave like this with a well, what I forgot to tell you, in, in the center of the wave over here, there's also a tunnel of wind. Think as if it was acting directly towards you from there, so it's running perpendicular to the to the direction of the air, and it's quite it's quite a strong wind. It's um, you could almost call it a jet stream. I've been in a wind tunnel like that with my airspeed indicator indicating 60 kilometers an hour, because that's what I learned to fly in. And me looking out the side of the aircraft and the mountain is moving forward past my, my cockpit. It makes you think. It makes you think you're hypoxic because you're fairly high up over here. You're talking 18,000, 20,000 feet now. And what was happening is we have an air mass of 90 kilometers towards me. I'm flying into it with the resultant 
with an airspeed of 90 knots, but I'm being pushed backwards over the ground with a resultant of 60 not knots going backwards, hence that, that um, jet stream of air was probably closer to 150 kilometers an hour coming towards me. But fabulous way to fly, um, absolutely great to get your altitudes, the type of thing you need to get your diamond altitude, definitely. Just a different picture of that, which gives you kind of, I found this one in the FAA, FAA book, same type of thing, a cap cloud over the mountain form, the rotors, the roll clouds, etc. Just a different way of looking at, looking at it. Really, really nice to fly in these conditions, but they happen few and far between. You do occasionally see them here. On the day, the day after the wind has really blown in southern Ontario, you can so sometimes see wavy cloud conditions across the sky. And that's due to just the small ridges we have here and the strong wind. It sets up these wave conditions. Here's graphic indication of that, and this, I believe, could be either Mount Fuji or Mount Rainier down here. Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji in the, in the wave. So influence of the shapes, wave, wave ob obstacles, and this has all been determined. A small little bump like that that you see up here doesn't really create enough of a ripple downwind. A, Slope up with a long slope down creates a very, it's, it's, it's not really good enough for wave as well. The, your wavelength becomes too long. This little bumpy hill over here, yep, it's starting to work. You're starting to see how that propagation of that wave is. This one's too high, but the back end is too, too, too slopey. It should be a lot steeper for it to work properly. And, of course, when you get resonance, when your wavelength equals um, the ridges down, when you get super wave conditions. Here's a different application or, or, or way of where wave will occur. When you have cloud streets and you happen to get a wind blowing across the top of the cloud street, so down here the wind is blowing in this direction, creating the cloud street. But over the top, you've got a wind coming this way, and there's an inversion layer on top of the cloud. You get the wind starting to create waves um, over the top of the cloud. And if you're lucky enough to be able to hook a thermal that will get you up the side of the cloud, you can get on top of it and fly the wave on top of the cloud. Haven't done this myself, would like to try it sometime. Um, once again, a, another picture of exactly what happens in the upper winds when the upper wind is crosswind to the lower winds. And we, we get a lot of this happening in our neck of the woods where you've got totally different wind directions and altitude. It's quite remarkable how that happens. Safety in flying in wave, you get to great, great altitudes. Hypoxia is a problem. I've been up to 26,500 feet. You keep an eye on your nails. You make sure the oxygen is running from 12,000 or even 8,000 upwards. If you grew up at sea level or fly at sea level and we do where we do, that oxygen gets going at 8,000. I was flying from living at 6,000 feet. I could probably get up to 15 quite happily without oxygen. After that, you put the oxygen on. Um, hypoxia, when you get into human factors, well, what it does to you is it makes you feel all happy and warm and fuzzy in the early the early symptoms of it, so you think nothing is wrong. And the world looks very pretty outside, and then suddenly the black spots start flying past your eyes, and you start wondering what's going on. Quite insidious. Rotor, as we showed in that diagram before, where the air comes down the back end, gets bounced up, there's a rotor sitting over here. That's the upgoing rotor. That's fine. You can live with that, but it's quite bumpy. The downgoing rotor, which is sitting over here, you don't want to live with that. That's going to push you into the ground. Um, you can get flung in any direction in that rotor. It really is quite strong on aerotow. I've seen the tow plane at my 12 o'clock high, then suddenly at my 6 o'clock low, or to the left low, and then to the right high again. And eventually you just feel sorry for the tow pilot and you let him go. Very, very turbulent. It gets cold. 
of course, you know, your adiabatic collapse rate is three degrees per thousand feet. So the higher up you get, it gets seriously cold, minus 40 outside. The canopy on the non-sunny side um, of the aircraft will often have frost from your breath on it. It's that cold up there. Your feet normally stay fairly warm unless you have a toe hook sitting between your toes, which I had on that occasion, and I couldn't feel my toes for about three, my big toes for about three months after that. So icing in the cold weather, frostbite, and let's go back to our airspeed changes with increase in altitude. As the air gets thinner, that airspeed indicator doesn't do read properly anymore, so it's reading 100 knots, and you're probably doing 150 and getting very close to VNE. You've got to watch as you get higher and higher um, under, under wave. Your, your problem of VNE, which your velocity never exceed approaching where your um, your uh, your, your speed approaching your velocity never exceeds due to the thinness of the air, which is known as coffin corner. You've got no maneuverability. You can't go faster. Flutter. Flutter is a big danger, once again, because you are actually flying a lot faster than what you think you are. Be aware of it. That's Mount Rainier with some beautiful, beautiful lenticular clouds over it. And that would conclude thermals, waves, orographic lift, ridge lift, etc. Let's open up for questions on this and then let's try and get back to the discussion on passing on a mountain ridge. David, you want to open it up there? Yep, I'm just uh, unmuting people as, as we speak. So, uh, Good job, Tom. With, with all of that, um, were there any questions? And actually, I have two questions that are showing up. Hi guys, um, here's an example of wave from last wall, watch the altimeter. Okay, so that's a YouTube, and what I'll do, uh, Neil, is I'll share that YouTube on an email, so thank you for, for providing that. Um, yeah, expect uh, like 2,500 feet per second vertical, feet per minute, sorry, vertical. Yeah, it's, um, if you get into wave, now, uh, this is an example from wave, and now, is that is that at um, Cowley? Yeah, it is. No, and and that yeah. YouTube is just of the instrument panel, so don't expect to be seeing a lot of uh, uh, landscape or anything. It's just you're watching the guy's instrument panel. Watch the altimeter spin up. Neil, give give me give me a quick uh, 2,500 feet is how many knots? Uh, you know what? Oh, 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 just push it into meters a second. I want to know how strong well, it is over there. I'd love to come well, up. 2,500 um, would be somewhere close to... It would be 25 knots? 2,200. No, 25 knots. Yeah. Because mm, 200 feet knots. per minute is two, is two knots, right? 200 feet per minute is two knots? This is mm -hmm. 12 meters per yes. second, meaning no, uh, 25 right. knots. 25 yeah. knots. Wow, yeah, 25 that's knots. nice. Yeah. Um, That's you know, moving. I'm I'm having trouble copying that link. Can you email it to me? And then what I'll do is I'll I'll email it back out to everyone. Sure. Great. And Svetvan, uh, above the cloud street, uh, on a wave. So I think that's what the the there was a couple of slides there that that Tom had where. Um, when you get the cloud street happening, it, it sort of almost acts like a mountain ridge. Thank you, Tom. Um, where the upper winds will actually kind of flow over it, and you can actually see. Um, uh, um, uh, lenticular clouds forming. And this is a, a phenomenon that's being referred to now as prairie wave, where you're getting wave of, over flat ground. And there's a guy out of the mm -hmm. States, and he's, um, I think he's in Minnesota. He's a, a very active glider pilot. He's a doctor. Uh, he writes their, um, um, I think he's called Dr. Dan. He regularly writes for Soaring Magazine. And uh, he gave a presentation at the Soaring Society's convention uh, that I was at around Prairie Wave and, and talking about these concepts and he's 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 right now actively trying to figure out how to take advantage of this and, and how to how to work that. I think the biggest challenge though is you need to get up above the cloud street to get into it. So he's been able to do it with his Mooney. Uh, he just hasn't been able to do it with his glider. 
Yeah, that's that's a trick. You need that one thermal pop or something to get you up, and occasionally you can get up the side of a, of a cumulus. Yeah. That's and, exactly uh, right. I have a question about again the ridge soaring. Uh, with the with the hang glider or, or paraglider, for example, we we do this thing called uh, cloud ridge soaring. So you you kind of use the cloud as a because the wind is kind of hitting it and you're flying just in front of it. I know in Australia they have this uh, rare rare cloud called morning glory or something. I know they can do it with the gliders, but it's 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 a different speed there. So can you normally do this with a glider on non in Australia? You can fly in front of that, that morning glory, which is a huge roll cloud. That's really all it is, is a huge roll cloud. And on the on the front end of that, there'll be good upgoing updrafts, and you'll be able to fly that extremely well. It's like almost flying on the front of a very big thunderstorm. Once you're on the front yeah. of it, yeah. But I, what I wonder is there any other clouds that you could you could fly the same way, but that huge rolling cloud? Um, well, the cloud street is is similar to that. It's not quite a roll cloud, but on the, on the sunny upwind side of the cloud street. So um, let's say you, you've got this area here. You'd be able to fly along that edge of that cloud street quite happily. That's another type of cloud you can fly under. Um, lenticular clouds tend to be a bit smaller than that and a lot higher up. What else could you fly? I don't think there's a hell of a lot of other cloud that you could really do that with. Yeah, because you really need to have those two air masses converging one acting like the mountain and one acting like the the wind going up over it to to create that lift. So I, I think you know um, look for the conditions that you're flying in and and take the best advantage of. Um, I know Mike Ronan has often talked about using that sea breeze because when it hits the the um, uh, when it hits the the land, it, it, it creates basically a ridge of vertical because it's hitting the, the, the air mass on the land and, and sort of creating that effect. But again, it's it's fickle, and the challenge that you have is getting into a place where it is at an altitude where you can take advantage of it, right? So those are kind of your biggest challenges. Uh, and I have another question. This is, again, probably limitation in my lang language skills, but uh, is there a, the, the opposite effect of the wave? I know it in my language, we call it scissors. Mm -hmm. This is when you have something like wave but going downwind, down, downwards, towards the ground, not not up. Oh, is that a similar oh, thing? Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, go Tom. Sorry. This is when you, you have you, uh, the cold air mass tucking under, under a hot air mass. And you happen to have in, in between those right at that very moment. Mm. So you're not talking about microbursts or anything. No, mm, no I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not sure. Just... I'm. No. Oh, boy, it's uh, my microburst is very. Really... Keep asking questions. Your question. Oh, so I... we. <laughs> shall we get back to? Passing on the mountain thing that we spoke yeah. about earlier on. Yeah, so let, let's get back to the passing on the mountain. Svetvan, let, let's continue that conversation sure, uh, in okay. person. Yeah, because I, I, okay. I think I have an idea of what you might be talking about, and let, let's continue that on uh, in person, because we are at about 10 after 9, and I do want to respect people's time. Sure, okay, okay great. Sorry about okay. it. That's okay, That's Tom, Tom, passing on the ridge. Here's the one, right? We're looking at... Breaking up. Oh, Tom, you're breaking, breaking up big again. time. Let's see if we can get this right. Here comes jolly little me and my girl. Okay, D D David, why don't you why don't you explain it then if I'm breaking up too much? Okay, sure. Um, so we've got this glider flying along the ridge. Now uh, we're looking down at the top of the ridge. So off to the right there, you can see the the sort of slashy lines which are representing the ground. We've got our right wing tip off of the ridge. Now let's get a second glider in front of him. Perfect. Ooh, that's a that's that's one of those new snaky gliders. <laughs> All right. Um, so now I'm approaching from I'm I'm fly, actually I'll be flying the front glider here, and Tom's sneaking up behind me, and he's going faster. 
Now, the only direction I'm going to turn is to the left, because if I do a turn to the right, I'm, I'm dead, right? So the absolute only direction I'm going to be able to turn is to the left. And, and what Tom's drawing right now is a typical figure eight pattern where I would fly along with my right wing to the, the ridge, do that for a bit. When I get to the, you know, the end of the ridge or, or when I want to turn around, I would do my left turn. I would then angle back gently towards the ridge, snug up to it again in the opposite direction. Now, this is assuming that second glider is not there for the moment. And then I would, I would again, turn away from the ridge, snug back up, and, and you do this sort of figure eight. And that figure eight might be 100 miles long. Now... So we're back to Tom approaching from behind. He's going faster than I am. If he wants to pass me, if he pulls out to the left and goes past me on the left, well, that's a very dangerous situation because if I turn, I'm going to turn to the left and I won't see him coming. So what he needs to do is he needs to pass either, ideally he wants to pass a little bit to the right of me so that if I do turn, I'm going to turn away from the ridge. Now, the challenge that you run into, and this is what Dave's concern was, Dave Bradley's concern, was now Tom is being squeezed between me and the ridge. And if I decide to get a little bit braver and snug up to the ridge a little bit more, then you know I could squeeze Tom out. And this is absolutely a concern. But let's not forget that we have a vertical component, right? Tom may be a little yeah, bit higher. And also, if, you, if you can hear me at all here. Yeah. Yep. Um, you, you also have me in the back glider having you visual all the time. I can see what you're Absolutely. doing Absolutely. all the way through this. So if I see you going to head back in this direction, I'm going to get the hell out and dive underneath you. Absolutely. And, and, and really good point there where he says, you know, you can dive underneath me because now he can use that vertical component to gain some speed and, and get the heck out of there. And, of course, he is going to do a left turn to, to, to leave. So... Um, this this is how this thing works, right? Uh, you keep the other glider in vertical, uh, or excuse me, in, in visual range so that you've got eyes on them. And then as you approach and get closer, you monitor them very closely. And then let's also go back to something Jim said much earlier when it came to thermal and gaggle flying. Don't forget that we often have radios, right? So we might decide to say, you know what? I see that glider up ahead. Um, Perhaps I recognize the glider, or maybe I get close enough to, to see his, his you know, uh, contest numbers, and I can call, you know, 5-9, this is Victor Charlie November, I'm, I'm coming up from behind you, I'm going to pass, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, Dave, Dave Bradley, how does that sound? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's fine. I, I think it's a, it really comes down to judgment. At yeah. the time, uh, you and, know, rather than just following strict rules, because ab absolutely, someone and, might be quite close to the ridge. And yeah, and 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 let's layer a little bit of judgment into this. So, if you are a low time pilot and you don't feel comfortable flying in a gaggle, what are you going to do? Are you are you going to fly that gaggle? No, you're, <laughs> you're, you're going to go off and find uh, a different thermal, right? You, and you'll keep away. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And if, yeah. if I'm a lower time pilot on the ridge, and let's say Tom's in front and I'm coming up from behind, and maybe I'm in the Jantar and Tom's in the Krosno, so, so I'm flying faster than him, but I'm not comfortable enough really tightening into that ridge as close as he is because he's got more experience than me. Well, you know what? I do have another option. I can do my left turn and I can head back the other way. Right? I was going to say, you, 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 you can turn there and then and get it and go in the opposite direction and absolutely then turn back again and you've created a nice bit of space in absolutely it. right and i i went out to, to, to hope them. hope bc uh, a couple of years ago and i was flying the ridge um had a, had a nice little bowl that concave thing i was up there and there was another glider up there at the same level with me and, and we kind of ended up with this sort of circular pattern where we flew along the ridge and then we went out into the into the middle of the valley to lose some altitude and then back onto the ridge we're just kind of holding this nice altitude. And then he changed, and we were no longer, you know, opposite each other. And he got a little bit closer than I wanted. So I said, you know what, I'm going to change, and I did, and then I got a space back out, so we're opposite each other. Okay, so let's now talk about two gliders converging. So we've now got two gliders heading directly towards each other. The first glider, the, the lower one on your screen, that one there, the only direction that glider can turn is left. Now, the other glider, the direction it'll be turning, is right. And as we know, 
you alter course to the right to avoid the collision. Well, the first glider, the lower one, can't do that. So what it's going to do is it's just going to keep going straight ahead. And the other glider, it is now responsible for altering course away. Again, you're going to use some judgment here. You know, if you see that, that other glider approaching and he looks like he's not seeing you, maybe you're on the exact same level, you can always pop spoilers and drop down a bit. Um, you know, use some judgment there. Assuming that you both see each other, the correct option here is that if you are the top of those two gliders where the check mark is, you alter course to the right, the other one keeps going straight, right? So, and, and really, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of penned in by the ridge. Okay, so this next piece is what do you do when you're coming around a corner? Because you've now got a blind spot. So if I'm that first glider, I can't see around that corner to see the second glider. Okay, so this can be a real serious danger point, and you got to. This is where you got to keep your eyes open. You got to be really looking ahead. You got to be anticipating and just kind of seeing what what what's there, and then react. Now, assuming you both see each other at the exact same time, the top glider should alter course to the right. The other glider should stay tucked into the ridge. But again, use your best judgment. Okay, so if you're that top glider and you you see this other one coming around the corner do a big old right turn and get out of his way. Because remember, he can't move to the right, right? He's got a ridge in the way, okay? Um, and, and that's just one of those. It's also a lot of people, when they come to this kind of a scenario, it's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice a little bit of the lift and speed that I'm enjoying. Let's move out away from the ridge a little bit to give me a bit of extra room. It'll also help me sight that, that point a little bit better, right? Um, you know, decide what, what makes sense for you and what your comfort level is. And I think that covers it, Tom. Oh, sorry. Chris Andrew oh, has his hand up. I unmute myself, yes. Yeah. I'm listening. Chris Andrew has his hand up. Chris, what's up? I don't want to lengthen the conversation because I know it's late, but um, going back to two gliders flying in the same direction along the ridge, I'm flying faster than you, and I'm coming up from behind. You're, uh, you're already only 100 feet above the ridge. Um, I can fly over you and to the right? You, if, if you, yes, if you have higher altitude, so let, let's say you're 200 feet above me and I'm, I'm just cooking along the ridge and you come in higher, absolutely fly over. If you're at the exact same altitude, um, you may trade off a little bit of that speed for height to give you that little bit of margin and maybe pass a little bit slower, or maybe you can afford a little bit of extra speed and dive down and pick up a bit of speed. Um, yeah, my my point was that there's no written rule to go under or over the no. leading aircraft, uh, is there? It, it's safer to go over because the other glider will see you sooner. But, you know, you're going to do that assuming you have the height and or the speed. Now, one thing to be aware of, hawks and vultures and birds of prey that soar on the ridge, when they're startled, they will dive. So if you're if you're gonna pass a hawk or a or a vulture or something and you come up on them, um, be aware that if the, you startle them, they'll dive. And and there have been instances where they they decided to dive down into the glider. Um, so you might get a passenger. You can, you can ask them for some tips. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure what you're drawing across the top there, Tom. Oh, it's gone. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how my touch screen could have helped me do my drawings. <laughs> All right. So I think we'll call this a night because it is 20 after. Uh, apologies to everyone. I forgot to upload the, uh, the, uh, the quiz. So what I will do is I will send that out on an email right away. Um, I'll do an email blast to all the attendees right now uh, as soon as we sign off. And again, thank you, Tom, for um, that great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And if you have any questions or think of anything, please continue the conversation later. And Neil, I look forward to seeing that uh, YouTube. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, have a great awesome. Day. Awesome job, guys.